uh, I want to, before we get started, I just want to give a very brief overview of the Chicago District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers um, and our area responsibility. In March of 2020, our area responsibility expanded to include the Wisconsin area that drains the Lake Michigan. Prior to that, we were, were uh, limited to the border of Illinois and Wisconsin. Uh, we cover about 32,000 square miles uh, across four uh, states. There's a little bit in Ohio, if you don't have on it, but it's a little bit uh, right in that location. Uh, we really have four key mission areas, uh, those being flood risk management uh, on riverine and coastal uh, systems, commercial navigation like the harbors uh, and inland channels, uh, aquatic ecosystem restoration. I have that highlighted here because that's the, the uh, primary purpose of this particular project. And then regulatory as well. We, we uh, work to uh, maintain wetlands um, and, and our waterways. Um, so here's a map of our district boundaries um, and uh, some of the pictures here. Let's go to the next slide. So everything that the Corps of Engineers does, we need authority from Congress and we need appropriations from Congress. So the authority that we're operating under for this particular project is the Great Lakes Fishery and Ecosystem Restoration Authority, which is given to the Corps of Engineers in, in uh, Section 506 of the Water Resources Bill of 2020. So about you know, 23 years we've had this authority. We've done what we call GLIFR projects. is a programmatic authority across the Great Lakes. It's a regional authority. Um, and really, it gives us the ability to plan, design, and construct aquatic ecosystem restoration projects to support fisheries, ecosystem, and beneficial uses within the Great Lakes. Uh, Orlick Dam, this particular project, is in the planning phase. So uh, out of the three phases, plan, design, and construct, we're in the planning phase right now. Um, this authority gives us the ability to move directly into design and implementation and it is a cost-share authority. The Corps of Engineers and the federal government provide 65% of the planning, design, and construction, and the non-federal sponsor, which was came forward, as, as Raleigh said, the Racine County Public Works, uh, would provide the remaining 35% to this project. We do have a per-project federal limit of $10 million per project. We're well below that for this particular project. Um, but before we, we kind of, I wanted to set the stage on what the authority is that the Corps of Engineers is operating under. So I'm going to trans, transfer this now to Sam Belsick, who is the lead planner and biologist on this particular project. Sam? Thank you, David. <coughs> County Public Works as our head of non, non federal sponsor. And the big thing with this project here is that it, the uh, Core Lake Dam stands as the last barrier between the upper Root River watershed, which is about 200 square miles, and then the connectivity between Lake Michigan. It's about 600 miles from Core Lake Dam to Lake Michigan. Um, and what we're dealing with here is largely an impounded area above the Root River, above the Core Lake Dam. Very lake-like system for about 60 acres, which we can see on this side over here, and then downstream we have that natural riverine system. And on the right-hand side is our more Jungian version, where you can see Four Lake Dam um, off the highway, off of Northwest Avenue, right there. So, as Raleigh had previously mentioned, Four Lake Dam is classified as a low hazard dam. It is a run of the river dam, which means that it doesn't provide much uh, flood storage. Essentially, any water coming in goes out. Um, and this is a series of multiple dams with the original construction in the, 19, in the 1830s, excuse me, several rebuilds with the latest rebuild in 1975. We do have some images um, of some of those previous dams with the most recent construction down here in the bottom. So upstream, we've got this more Atlantic. Uh, Lake-like conditions, there's a lot of poor water quality, um, poor sediment quality with a lot of sediment build up behind the dam. Uh, downstream, it's more flowing. We've got the bedrock, uh, river, dam exposed areas, um, and a high substrate quality, which is great for fish habitat. 
So there is a need to address this degraded habitat, and then the other is there's this need for connectivity between Lake Michigan, the lower reaches of the river, and that upper watershed of the 200 square miles. So the purpose is to really restore those that habitat and connectivity for fish and wildlife. As part of our documentation, we look at some of the problems and opportunities. As I said, <coughs> it is the most significant fish passage obstruction on the Root River and has been barrier for over 150 years. So that's a restriction of upstream migration for fish, genetic diversity, um, and it just doesn't happen because of that riverine fragmentation. So some of the species that we're interested in are the long sucker, the northern pike, smallmouth bass, walleye, and of course our sun mounted for, um, for sport fishing. Um, the other thing that the dam does is it does alter the riverine process. This image here right here shows very much this lake-like condition above. We've got this nice little black line where it's a very stagnant lake-like condition, a very steep drop that actually shows that 12-ish feet elevation. Um, completely cutting off the upper um, watershed from the lower watershed. And it also scours the substrates below the dam, so it, it really reduces the habitat. Um, there's some opportunities to really um, work on the water quality degradations and improve uh, human safety if, if the dam isn't there. So our objective to, is to really reestablish quality and connectivity of the habitat. We can do this through reestablishing the hydrologic and hydraulic and geomorphic parameters that really support the riverine habitat for those fishes, and then reestablishing that hydraulic connectivity for those species so they can move up and actually utilize the upper watershed uh, that's available to other organisms. So we have some just um, representative organisms. We've got some turtles, another northern pike, a nice rainbow trout there, and, and a really nice um, example of healthy water system there. We do have constraints and considerations with our planning process. Naturally, we do not want to flood people out. This includes landowners, public roads, etc. And then we also don't want to um, increase the amount of sediment and just dump a bunch of sediment downstream if we don't want that dam. So that's something that we really want to consider is restrict the sediment transport um, to less than average the annual sediment budget. Um, some other con considerations that we want to think about is providing some opportunities for um, uh, blue wave paddles and trails for um, pulling trips. We really want to promote um, improvements in the water and water quality, and then we also want to uh, consider preventing and limiting upstream migration of invasive species. So those are some considerations that we need to think about. We are. Um, we are the planning branch, we are the planning department, so we do um, consider multiple plans. Um, we naturally consider the no alternative, the no action alternative, and then we also consider these ones as well. So we've got full dam removal, which is just as it says. It's removing the dam. Um, the uh, next one is full dam removal with sediment removal behind the dam. Um, just in case if there was any contaminants in the sediment, you need to and want to remove those sediments, contaminated sediment, and dispose of them properly before you remove the dam. A bypass channel which is on the bottom right hand corner there, which includes excavating kind of around the dam so that you can create a fish passage um, for um, some species of fish. A fish ladder, which is in this bottom corner over here, that's more of a concrete structure, uh, like a stepped ladder system for fish to grow up, to go up and over the dam. And then some instant habitat, which could be um, boulders, rocks, um, large weeds, <coughs> and things like that, and then repairing some plantings along the riparian zone. Um, and after we do our initial array of alternatives, we do go through an initial screening process to determine which of these alternatives um, are more likely to be successful um, and therefore we can warrant more consideration and more analysis. So right off the bat, when we ended up screening things through, um, building removal does meet our objectives of the habitat and connectivity and of course is acceptable to the our non-federal sponsor. The full dam removal with sediment removal was screened out since there was no um, it, um, there was no contamination issues in the sediment behind the dam, so we didn't have to worry about that. The bypass channel does meet the objective of passing some fish, but it really kind of limits that connectivity, but we still want to consider it and do some more analysis. 
Um, the fish ladder was a screened out because it only partially meets the objective of allowing us to fish passage since um, more just the salmonid type fish can use it, utilize the fish ladder and some of the smaller fishes um, would not really be able to use the <coughs> and um, uh, pass through the pass above the dam in a fish ladder. In-stream habitat provides um, some quality fish habitat, so we want to move that forward and look at that as well. And then riparian zone plantings it does provide habitat, however, um, it wasn't acceptable to our NAFA sponsor because there's a lot of real estate interest um, and we just didn't have the real estate availability to do all of those plantings. So once we had our, alter um, our alternatives that we were looking at after that initial screen, we went through our process of evaluating and comparing these alternatives. Um, and for ecosystem <coughs> restoration projects, the Corps of Engineers tends to use um, habitat models to quantify the benefits of individual alternatives so that we can determine, one, how much lift um, we can expect for the federal investment. Um, we measure this through habitat units, um, so we can utilize a qualitative habitat index um, and some streamlining. Um, and then as, as well as we also want to use this information um, to determine how those alternatives compare against each other. So once we have those um, habitat units and we have the cost estimates, we can effectively run a, um, we can perform a cost effectiveness and incremental cost analysis, and that's going to identify our cost effective plan or our best buy alternative. So our table here uh, does uh, go through the process where we looked at the full dam removal, we looked at the bypass channel, we also looked at our in-stream habitat, and then we ended up combining and having another plan of our bypass channel and in-stream habitat so that we could have that connectivity and fish habitat. Um, and our full dam removal was identified as our cost-effective, our best buy. Um, it does result in the highest average annual habitat units, so it's producing the most habitat units and has the lowest cost per habitat unit gained. Um, in terms of our environmental quality benefits, um, we do have an analysis over on the slide where we can kind of see how those different environmental benefits are either met, not met, or partially met um, per each of those plans. And again, the full dam removal supports um, restoring the river hydrology and geomorphology, it restores that habitat connectivity, and it maximizes connectivity for all aquatic organisms, whereas the bypass channel is only for partial. So therefore, our alternative A, folder removal, is the plan that we have identified as our tentatively selected plan. Okay, a lot of words. <laughs> um, so the tentatively selected plan is our folder dam removal, which is the demolition and removal of coral dam to the natural bedrock elevation. So this is going to include a number of steps. I do have a poster in the back that does go through the steps as well. So if you do have questions kind of throughout our comment period and whatnot, feel free to look at that as well if you were in the back there. So we're going to start with um, an incremental demolition with stage dewatering. We do not want to just release a flood pulse of sediment downstream. We want to do this slowly. So the way we're going to do this is by utilizing the stop logs that are already in the dam. So this photo over here on the my right, your left, on this side, this is a photo of extremely low water levels, and it clearly shows our stop logs right up there. Okay. Um, and the state slow incremental dewatering is that you're gonna very slowly over time remove each one and slowly lower those water levels. It will take several months. We're anticipating at least two months to just draw down the water. And again, this is so that we're not releasing a blood pulse of sediment downstream. Don't want to smother things. We want to do it slowly. After this is, um, after all the stock logs are removed and this drawdown has happened, the next thing to do is to remove the concrete structure from the top down using machinery that is acceptable and appropriate for aquatic work. The reason we don't want to just start digging from the bottom is again, we don't want that additional sediment that's still behind the dam to be released in the slope. We also do not want to blast the dam. There's a lot, of, there's recurring odors and there's an inn right next door. We don't want to do that. So uh, this photo down here, that's from the Hoffman Dam, in which they slowly, from the 
top down are creating a notch, allowing more water down, and then continuously removing that concrete. The side abutment walls would remain of the dam so that they can provide some additional stability. And then lastly, once everything is removed and um, uh, and take a gun, uh, we'll go ahead and recycle and dispose of all the material generated from the demolition. As part of our best practices, we know that the impounded water level is going to drop. So you're going to have a very muddy riparian zone. But part of our best practices is we want to use temporary erosion control by putting in cover crops on those exposed areas. So these would be the exposed areas that are within the impoundment, like seven bars. But then it's also going to be the exposed areas of the riparian zones upstream in between the current ordinary high water mark, so where the water currently is now, the highest part, to our new ordinary high water mark. So that includes riparian landowners in, within that 60 miles, or excuse me, the 60 acres of upstream impoundment, as well as having some water runoff control, stormwater pollution prevention thing. Thanks to that effect. So, um, since I'm a visual person, and I assume other people are as well, we did create some renderings. Um, it's a rendering flow. Um, so we have this existing image here, where we have the uh, we are looking north east um, from the bridge, and we have four lake dam. And then on the right hand side, we have our post dam removal, in which we've got a bedrock, rapids, and ripples um, system there. So we're anticipating that we would have about 80 feet between each of the walls from the left and the right side um, that would now be open water. And we are anticipating that there's a possibility of about 500 feet of bedrock that could be exposed. So we opted for more of like a bedrock cascade type style for our rendering here, because um, there is a chance that we are gonna expose some bedrock. And we already know that downstream, we already see some of the bedrock. So there you go. Um, I do also have those same images in the back, along with additional information about some other things that we would expect. Um, so some of the stuff that we are going to expect is that um, obviously we're going to have this connectivity and this increase in habitat, but we're also going to have that opportunity for recreation. So increased paddling, increased fishing, not only here, but also upstream as well. <laughs> So right off the bat, um, we've identified that there are no significant adverse impacts to natural and cultural resources, which means that this can result in an environmental assessment and a finding of no significant impact, and we do not need to have an environmental impact statement. And some of the things that I wanted to highlight on here um, for some of our uh, resources that we looked at, um, the green really shows those benefits. Uh, we're anticipating benefits to those aquatic resources and uh, wetlands, to fish and wildlife habitat, to the hydrology, we're returning this river back to its natural state, and increasing that water quality. So some of these benefits to the dam removal, which kind of highlighted there, I also have a poster in the back that highlights these as well. We're really looking at, um, the big one is that ecosystem restoration, right? We are under our aquatic ecosystem restoration mission, so that is the goal, and returning that river to its natural state with a healthy channel morphology is really um, meeting that goal for ecosystem restoration. In addition to restoring that habitat for fish, insects, other organism, uh, organisms, etc. Um, some other benefits include the increased fish passage so they can regain access to those 200 square miles of upper um, root river watershed as well as really increasing some genetic diversity between these two areas that were previously cut off for over 50 <coughs> years. Um, there would be definitely an increase in water quality. Now we're no longer dealing with the stagnant water in these lake-like impoundment above the dam. Um, you're gonna have higher levels of dissolved oxygen and there'll be more water flow. Um, so you definitely see an increase in, in that, as well as a reduced flood risk. 
Um, I know when people think of dams, they think of dams as flood storage. This is still a run of the river dam, so it really doesn't provide flood storage. But by restoring the hydrology and hydraulics of the river back to more of its natural state, it can really, um, a, a, it can really restore the ability of uh, floodwaters to be able to absorb those floodwaters, and it spreads it out over a wider area. So the fact that that flood dynamics gets restored really reduces the risk of catastrophic flooding that could have happened that could happen up within in the case of the dam being there. Um, as I previously mentioned, we've also got increase of recreation opportunities, um, paddling, kayaking, paddling, etc. Already happens um, on the Root River above. The dam, we literally, as we were driving here, we were like, oh, there's, there's a dam. We're like, oh, there's some kayakers already. Um, so we're already using it. <coughs> we definitely know that with removing the dam, now we've got rapids that they can utilize for going downstream. And you also can promote these, uh, blue, these blue bays, the blue trails. So now you can go from above for the dam all the way down to Lake Michigan if you so desire. Um, additionally, there's increased fishing opportunities upstream. So with removing the leak lake condition, we're really removing um, and we're really putting this back to its natural hydrology in which now we've got ripples, runs, and pools uh, upstream as well. And now you've got the opportunity for a trout and the northern pike and all these other sport fish to go upstream of the dam. Like you could be on your backyard if you live on the root river, wade in and go fly fishing. And if, if you've got a nice little ripple in your back in your in your backyard. Um, so that is definitely um, an increased recreation opportunity. And the last two, we've got the long-term cost savings. Having the dam in place is, is infrastructure. It's going to cost <coughs> maintenance um, to, you know, money for maintenance and repairs and upgrades by removing it. You are taking those out. Um, the full dam removal would not have any operation and maintenance costs outside of our construction period. Um, so that would be you know, a long-term cost of zero. And then last thing is improving our safety. So obviously having a dam, you know, if someone goes over that dam on accident, if they're in a kayak or a boat or swimming, uh, that is definitely um, a, a risk of injury or death. Um, so having no dam there improves the level of life safety.
has no appreciable storage. Any flow that comes into that impounded area essentially goes over the dam. <coughs> that there's really no impact in the amount of flow by removing it. The, there's a benefit uh, upstream because removing that dam then reduces the water elevation uh, upstream of, of the dam. And so you now return the river to its natural floodplain. And the floodplain then has the ability to absorb, uh, really take the, the flood water. So you actually see a flood benefit uh, to removal of this dam because it is a running river dam that doesn't provide flood storage. Uh, we also have uh, those, those pictures uh, up on the poster board. Same thing in terms of um, you know, what the existing floodplain is versus the proposed floodplain. Uh, you'll see that um, during flooding there will be less area that's, that's flooded uh, and the repairing areas. Um, that's also shown here on the profile. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, we do know uh, that there is a number of concerns <coughs> from the public to the removal of dam in terms of water levels and um, the impounded area. And so um, I'm going to kind of run through this. Um, so upstream property owners, uh, what are the changes to the property conditions and river access? Uh, we anticipate uh, that there will be a decrease in the uh, daily water levels, as I mentioned. Um, you know, about nine and a half feet at the dam, and then that translates up to Highway 31 to about one foot. So the surface area of the river is going to reduce, and the depth uh, of the river will reduce. Um, it will also increase velocities. You won't have a lake condition, you'll have a flowing river again. Um, and that, that does result in improved water quality, uh, redu a reduction in odors, uh, so stagnant water conditions can, can tend to, to produce odors. Uh, when we return this to a free-flowing river, the odors will reduce. Um, Essentially, we're looking at about two foot per second is what the flow rate's going to be, which is essentially the same as what you see downstream of the dam right now. So we're not uh, inducing high flows by removing this dam or making you know, a nuisance uh, or life safety hazard. Um, and as I mentioned, there'll be a decrease in potential flood damages uh, due to returning the, the natural flood plain. The second concern that we know is the downstream folks. Um, you know, the country flood that's downstream of the uh, existing dam, uh, will there be aesthetic changes? Um, we anticipate that you shouldn't see really any change, uh, very, very little change downstream of the dam. Um, we're not gonna see um, you know, additional erosion or um, you know, any impacts to vegetation um, because of uh, how you know, the dam doesn't provide storage, so it's not changing the flows uh, at all. Uh, the majority of the, of the sediment that's currently behind the dam will transport down uh, the six miles to Lake Michigan, and that, that uh, those sediments will end up in the littoral zone of Lake Michigan and then start to nourish the, the, uh, the shoreline down here. Um, everything there. So significant deposition where we don't anticipate a sediment problem. I will say, you know, we worked on a lot of ecosystem restoration projects, a lot of several dam removals. It's really refreshing to see a dam that does not have contaminated sediments behind it. So I would say pretty lucky. Uh, that's the, a lot of a lot of dams have contaminated sediments that we have to deal with. Um, the, the third uh, public concern that we know of is um, you know, the fish hatchery that's, that's downstream. Are you going to be increasing you know, flood impacts? Is that going to negatively impact the, the fishery, uh, the, the fish hatchery? And we, we just like the, um, the country club and other areas, we don't anticipate any impacts to flooding mm -hmm. downstream of the dam. Um, or, or there will be no increase uh, in magnitude or frequency of any of uh, flows, either during normal flows or during flood conditions. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, I think now it's Nick's turn to talk about real estate. There's a lot of words here, I won't read every word. Um, so yeah, on this project, we are, there's a real estate department on any project we work on. 
This one is a you know relatively small real estate footprint. Uh, so we're looking at you know less than a tenth of an acre for in fee simple, that's gonna be the footprint of the dam. So we're seeing county already owns the dam. We're just gonna require it because they're removing it, they're changing that forever, they need to own it in fee. Uh, so just like you own your home. And then we've got uh, about 1.3 acres of temporary work area easements in the park right next to the dam. That's just gonna be work, storage, you know, access, allow us to get our equipment in, store the equipment, make sure that we're not, you know, no one's planning a soccer game while we're, we've got a backhoe uh, or an excavator park there. And then the, the biggest chunk of the real estate, and I'm sure this is why most of you are here, um, is we're looking at about 36 acres of temporary work area easements for that uh, temporary cover planting that we, we talked about earlier. So when this water, you know, when the dam gets removed, the water's gonna come down, and as that river draws more into the center of the channel, we're gonna have these exposed areas. And I'm sure many of you, you know, if you've got that riparian land, uh, you don't want that to just be mud and sitting there, and we don't want that either. So we're planning on doing a, a cover planting there, just kind of jump start, um, and then allow the natives to recolonize. So we're looking at, you know, if there's the soil there, it's pretty, you know, there's nutrients, there's other plants around. Um, we're not looking at like a, you know, an industrial site where it's stripped out. So we're gonna put that cover planting in uh, to prevent erosion, but just for, I guess, real quick, who here owns property on the river? I'm guessing a good amount of people do. So for, for those who do or don't, um, in Wisconsin, if you're wondering, if you live on a river, if it's a navigable river, which in Wisconsin, as I'm sure many of you know, just about any river is navigable. If you can float a canoe down it, uh, at least part of the year it's navigable. Your property line is gonna go to the thread of the stream. So that, not just the center of the stream, but the, the deepest, fastest part of the stream there. And your title for your land is gonna go there, and then the public has a right to navigation over it. So you already own it, you know, if you're on the river, you're not gonna own any new land, you already own this land, it's just underwater. It's not really, you know, much use uh, for anything but looking at it and fishing on it. Um, but you can't build on it, you're not gonna be able to um, really hang out on it. So what we're doing here is when that, uh, you know, you've got that ordinary high water mark, which is, that's just where if you go on the bank right now, I guess you can't see the river out this window, but if you look on the bank, the ordinary high water mark is just where the water is made of <coughs> You know, different. If you look, you can say that's where the bank of the river starts. And then we're going to take the area between that current high water mark and that new high water mark. And that's where we're planning on doing those plantings. So, depending on where your property is, that may be, we're looking at, um, I think, around 30 to 50 feet um, from the current high water mark to the new high water mark. And then we've got some bigger areas on uh, land county owns. So, we'll be doing bigger plantings there. But for the most part, we're looking you know, relatively narrow strip um, that we're gonna be looking at for here. Let me just go to the next slide. Um, and yeah, we already talked about what's your property gonna look like. So your property, as I said before, your property is gonna be the same size. That's not changing, your ownership's not changing. It's gonna look different, especially if you're on, you know, more impounded area, it's gonna look less lake-like, more stream-like. Um, but overall, you know, if you, D, if you look at your property on a map, uh, it's going to be the same size. And then a question we've got a few times, are there any restrictions on your land as a result of this project? So we're getting these temporary easements, uh, or temporary work area easement, if anyone's interested, we can you know, provide you with the language as you can as well. But it doesn't restrict you from using the land. All it does is it's going to allow um, either us or the county or a contractor <coughs> to come onto the land and put these planting. So all that's doing is providing permission to access the land um, and do the work. So it's not going to keep you, you know, if you want to go out there and play in the mud uh, before we do our planting, you're welcome to or after we've done our planting. Um, but there's nothing that, you know, we're not restricting your use of it. And they are, they are temporary easements. So our standard one is three years on this. It's probably going to be a little shorter. Um, but it is, you know, temporary easement. Once it expires, your land is exactly the same. It's not going to be like a utility easement where it's perpetual um, or any sort of flood easement. And then a big question we get a lot is how will this affect property values and taxes? I, I'm not a tax expert, and other states a little different. Uh, so property values, you know, the, the big change we're seeing to your property is that you're gonna is primarily an aesthetic change. In some cases, I can't say all oh, you may you know, gain buildable area in your property, um, but 
what the value of your property is before and after is kind of going to be subjective. If someone prefers that, you know, more impounded area, that kind of lake-like uh, view out their window, it might be worth more to them. Um, but some people might prefer that stream-like, that more natural system. So, you know, property value is basically based on what people are willing to pay. And as far as taxes, I'm, I'm not a tax expert. I would encourage you to reach out to uh, your local tax assessor if you have questions. But your property size isn't changing at all and this wouldn't be improvement on your property or anything. So it should have, to my understanding, it shouldn't be an effect. But if you've got, you got concerns, just talk to your tax assessor, talk to you know, your accountant, and um, you should be able to answer any more specifics on those. One more slide. Uh, and then, just real quick, our real estate acquisition uh, basically runs in sync with our final design process. So once we get to a certain spot and we've got, you know, this project moves forward, once we're pretty confident in what it's going to look like, uh, what real estate we need, we'll go. We're going to send uh, a notice to acquire to the county. So the county's going to go out uh, once we've sent that notice to acquire, and they're going to do the actual acquisition. So you're not going to hear from the Corps of Engineers um, in this regard. You're all going to communicate with the county or you know, if they choose to hire someone. Uh, but yeah, we're going to do it's going to be a full standard you know, government acquisition if you've ever seen one of these before for any other sort of government project, it's going to be the same. We'll do a you know, title search, we'll make sure the title's all good, we'll do a survey of the property to be acquired, they'll map it out, they'll write a legal description for these easements, and then they're going to perform an appraisal, and these appraisals need to meet federal standards um, as well as state standards for acquisition um, to determine the fair market value of that easement. So it's not going to be a fee acquisition, um, it's going to be an easement acquisition. Um, just, just so you're aware, you're, you know, it's not going to be a, a huge buying your whole property. And then they'll negotiate with you. So the county, uh, in these cases, they're going to you know, talk to you, communicate. If, if you feel at any point you're not getting a fair deal, there are, um, you know, it's like any other real estate transaction, there's going to be a negotiation. We're not just going to come in and force you to give these um, easements. But we are, you know, there is limitations. And ultimately, the taxpayers are going to be you know, funding this project. And then once the county completes their acquisition, they're going to submit it to us. Our attorney's going to look, make sure the real estate looks good, uh, everything's you know what we think we need. And then hopefully around the same time, we should finish our final plans, and we will certify the real estate. We'll say it's all good to go. We'll have our plans, and we can send it out to um, you know bid. So we're going to do the construction on the project and bid. And just real quick, um, this is a pretty good run rundown. Feel free to ask me questions later if you want. Um, but this is kind of what it's showing the same information as these maps back here. This is just the real estate uh, one. But all these yellow areas are going to be the area between the current high water mark and the uh, new high water mark. So that's kind of what we're expecting. It's presented the same way here, but this is just a little simpler view. But this is kind of um, a tentative map, and that may change. Um, these are hydraulic modeling, and some of our plans change a little. But for the most part, at least up to around here, it should be you know, pretty close to what we're expecting. Thank you, Nick. All right, so the last question that I have is about the last major known concern that we are really wanted to be aware of is the species. So, for the team, is the last barrier on the Deep River watershed between Lake Michigan and the Upper Watershed. And Lake Michigan does have invasive species, so that could be a concern. The two major ones are sea lamprey and the round boat. So sea lamprey, um, they decimated the Great Lakes ecosystem pre-1960s, and then pretty much from the 1960s onward, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife has essentially reduced the population in the Great Lakes by 90%. So right off the bat, it's already a lower, a lower concern. However, um, there is already potential habitat for the sea lamprey downstream of the Lake Dam. And for the last hundred years, there have been no records of sea lamprey in the Root River. And in general, there's actually a very low population of sea lamprey in the lower southern Lake Michigan basin anyway, so it's not entirely surprising that there's no records. Additionally, some of the other things that we were looking at is um, uh, we coordinated a lot with U.S. Fish and Wildlife and uh, Wisconsin DNR, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, they went out and they conducted a sea lamprey potential habitat survey upstream of the dam. Essentially, they went through 
and to, uh, just to see if there's any potential spawning habitat that sea lamprey would be interested in, as well as trying to see if there's any native sea lamprey, excuse me, native lamprey <coughs> that are already in the system. The sea lamprey, if they're going to go into a new stream, a lot of times they're attracted to existing lamprey pheromones, even from um, native lamprey. Uh, so their report came back that there was a very low risk of a sea lamprey invasion in this in the uh, uh, upstream of the dam. And then lastly, uh, one of the other things that we did was, um, as part of our coordination with the DNR <coughs> and Fish and Wildlife, um, we really wanted to make sure that we one monitor. So we will be monitoring at, um, post uh, post game removal for not only for fish habitat success and, and restoration success, but also for uh, sea lamprey and any other invasive species. But there was also discussion of a contingency plan in case we do find some sea lamprey. So there is the Root River uh, Steelhead facility, it's a, the hatchery downstream. They have a weir that they um, can raise and lower throughout the season based on whether or not they're trying to get um, uh, fish eggs and whatnot uh, for the for steelhead. Um, and they discussed that that is a possibility to be able to use that as a temporary barrier during sea lamprey spawning seasons if sea lamprey are found migrating up the stream. So um, we are very hopeful that that will never be the case. Um, in fact, we've um, identified between fish and wildlife, DNR, and ourselves that the risk is very low, uh, but it is still a risk that we want to be aware of with monitoring. Um, the last one is the brown gobies. So brown gobies, we are everywhere um, in Lake Michigan. In fact, we do have some records of um, brown goby in Lake Michigan at the mouth of the Root River. However, there's no records inside the Root River, actually upstream of the Root River between Lake Michigan and the Port Lake Dam. So uh, that one is also a low risk as well. Uh, so we're not um, we're not going to be uh, too worried, but we are going to be monitoring that. So after this, I'm going to give it to you. Okay. All right. So now that we have an idea of the federally selected plan and the risks uh, and benefits associated with it, what does this look like moving forward? So right now we're in the planning, the feasibility stage, where our public comment period is ending at the end of the month on June 30th. So if you'd like to submit a public comment, please do that in the next few weeks here. And then we're anticipating the feasibility report approval to occur by the end of the year in December of 2023. Mm -hmm. Following that, we need to enter a design agreement with Grayson County Public Works, which we anticipate a few months later on, <coughs> February 2024, which then would facilitate our ability to do the engineering design plans and specifications of the project. So near the end of that, we need to execute the project partnership agreement so that we can prepare for construction of the project and the final construction plans and specifications will happen sometime after that, likely in January 2025, which would facilitate us to have a construction contract award and have construction start sometime in 2025 in the spring, early summer. And that will be about a two-year phase ending in the spring of 2027 and followed up by our <coughs> monitoring and a portal down on biologically, hydraulically, following that for another set of years. Uh, ending in the spring of 2030 to make sure that everything is planned and that we can do any contingencies that's needed. So that's what this looks like moving forward. And that brings us to our next slide here. Um, the public comment, which you can find if you haven't already, we should have some uh, barcodes up there that you can get this information as well. But you can find the report available on our website here at that link and the project webpage as well. There should be links um, on those two now as well. And then ways to comment is during this meeting, we're going to have a three minute oral comment or fill out a comment form. We have a comment box up at the front there where you walked in, um, I believe. Or you can send an email to Sam here at Samantha, period D, period Belsic at US, or usace.army.mil. And you can also mail, it must be postmarked by June 30th, 2023, to our Chicago District Office with the connection of Sam Balsig in the Planning Department at 231 South of Street, Suite 1500, Chicago, Illinois, 60604. Okay. I'm going to give it back to our MC.
Thank you. So that wraps up our formal, <laughs> formal presentation part of the evening. Uh, now we're going to move into that public comment period that uh, both Sam and Patrick have mentioned. If you didn't get one of these sheets on the way in, I'd recommend grabbing one on the way out. Uh, we have plenty. Uh, if they run out of the table, I'd go under the table. Uh, take that with you. It's got the same information about how to interact with us on our website or uh, directly with Sam through email. So the way that we typically do our the formal public comment period here, uh, Patrick got a recording, so it'll be part of the official record. If you want to say something uh, out loud to all your peers and neighbors today, uh, we ask you to keep your statement to about three minutes. Uh, I'll be monitoring time. I'll give you maybe a one-minute warning while you're running down. If you don't feel like you're done, I think we have enough time to go longer. I just ask that you pause, uh, respect the other folks who are in line, and maybe hop back in the back room. So I think we'll just do it right here. So if, uh, the folks who signed up, um, and I'll call you, you can just sort of queue up here, maybe George and Kurt first. Uh, it's George Vanguard and Kurt Cooper. You can actually say, oh, I was if you would just um, maybe announce yourself with the group, introduce yourself, yeah. and then okay. um, make a comment, I will have a comment. Most of the questions have been answered. Um, George Longberg at 3345 Gatsby, just across the river here. And um, we've been here for 23 years, and we've seen the use of the impoundment um, all year long. I mean, the <coughs> snowmobilers, everything else. And, you know, a tremendous asset. And when we started hearing about problems with the river, it was like eight, ten years ago. They were talking about the quality of the water and everything else. And it turned into, okay, we're going to take the dam out. And I thought, oh, can't we compromise? And does it have to come out completely? Can it be a combination of I thought the fish ladder, when I saw the thing for the diversion thing, can that be accomplished? Okay, it's also kind of a question. Is that reasonable here? Short answer is we're trying to just do comments here. And we're okay. Okay. Give your time responding, but the short answer is it's feasible, and uh, the, as Sam explained, it was one of the alternatives. Uh, All right. Right. Okay. And also now, with the silt going down the river, um, are you going to be, I'm going to ask you a question, um, is it going to be dredged at least partially back to make this 12-foot, 14-foot drop smoother for somebody going on the river? No, it won't be. So it'll just be natural and everything will run down so that the, uh, the yacht club can complain about the like, silt. Thank you, George. Uh, Kurt, is it for you, Kurt? And then maybe while 
weren't speaking, uh, could RJ, James, and Kat maybe either queue up or just make himself known? Uh, could be in line after her. Hey, uh, like the resident of the uh, great free scene, uh, Dan Sailor. I have a question about the center of those. I've been talking about that a lot of stuff, but you know, I think it's okay to stuff. As soon as our kids are, 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 are harbor, the water slows down and then it settles. So I'm thinking, are we going to have issues and stuff in the future and stuff in, in, in our harbor where we're going to have dredges and the detection of all That's how big it's going to have. And then one other thing that Henry brought up is that, in fact, correct me if I'm wrong, but right now, Walkershaw is setting up stuff to take the water from the Michigan. How they're planning on returning that water after being treated is down in the river. And how is that going to flow the flow rates and stuff like that in the river once they have that? You know, that's, that's a quite, quite a big a big establishment. I mean, you know, walk shop quite a big place and stuff like that. I mean, how much water are they supposed to take? How much are they supposed to send out? Is that going to affect our flow rates and stuff like that potentially and stuff? Like that? No? It's pretty nominal. Well, I don't know. I just, oh, it's just a question that comes to my mind. Yeah, it is in the report. So we do discuss the water. Okay. Uh, okay, RJ and Ben Swole, I hope I'm saying that right. I can come to you, RJ. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, it seems to me that a lot of this, uh, the only impact is from the dam to Highway 31. A lot of below the dam has not really any impact other than the sediment that's going to flow down. Above 31, that's been that way for 200 years, whatever it is, since it's run the river. And I also, whatever, uh, for you, with the sediment thing, when we remove it, it's not going to flow all the way out into the lake. It's going to go into the lower river basin. Um, and it's going to fill up. Is there any contingencies or things for doing dredging? I mean, that's going to be a lot of salt that's going to be going down there. We have the harbor, we have the Root River facility, of the yacht clubs and all that. And just making sure that's all taken into <clears throat> uh, consideration. B, you have a lot of pictures of canoeing and kayaking, and this is all great in the river. This is the only section of the river you can do it in, other than like high water events. Uh, you're going to be taking that away from everybody. And uh, <clears throat> I know a lot of people like canoeing. We actually do it sometimes too. We can ice fish down here, your snowmobile down here is a year long thing. That everyone enjoys that we take away. <clears throat> the third main thing is the round goobies. Uh, you had on there that there is just some round goobies at the mouth of the river and none up by the dam. That couldn't be any further from the truth. I fish above, I fish below, and I have my whole life. Uh, you can see gobies all over down <clears throat> river the dam. When we were younger, perch was big in Lake Michigan. You could go down to Lincoln Park, Island Park, and catch crayfish as many as you could get. Throw a little piece of liver or something like that, flood in two minutes later, you had a hundred of them. Now you can never even see a crayfish anymore since the gobies dam. You go fishing down there, you see them everywhere. And, uh, did some research. I mean, anywhere that the Gobi has been, it's been bad. Up from the Danube and some of the other rivers in Europe to other rivers in the eastern Great Lakes. And uh, all those, that if you take it out, they're just going to run upstream and uh, a lot of the native fish will be uh, negatively impacted. And that's very well documented. And uh, I just hope you guys take better consideration of that. It seems like a lot of these things have been washed over. And I know you're going to save money because we don't want to rebuild the dam, but I think a lot of people here in support of keeping it, or at least uh, trying to keep uh, keep that in mind. I know 90% of it's better, but it seems like this would be a 10% of the time that it's not. So I know my time's probably. No, you got all in if you want. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, those are the main things. Thank you. 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 Yeah, it just seems like there's a lot of the only pros of taking it out, but we yeah, glanced over a lot of the negatives and, uh, and some of the pros of keeping it. I mean, if you guys have any pros of keeping it, has that ever been about? And it just seems like it's always like, what are we going to do to rip it out? But what about more thoughts of keeping it? And 200 years about the river, everything's been happy and pretty stable now. I, I hope that everyone here just takes that into consideration. Absolutely. Absolutely. Also, on the land, I've never heard this a little bit north of here. And right now, what I have is a half acre of land fronting on the water. What I'm going to have is a half acre of land 
150 feet of bottom land, bottom land that's going to be weed covered, hundreds of submerged and semi submerged logs. And I have to believe it's going to have a gigantic negative effect on my land value. What I don't understand is how I went through the entire report. Listen to this entire presentation. And nowhere did it say, we studied what effect this is going to have economically on the people who are on the river. Not only did you not study it, because you didn't study it, you don't have a clue what it is, and you couldn't possibly have considered it. Especially for the county. These are taxpayers, these are voters, and the county's gonna go ahead and say, yeah, rip our dam out without even knowing, not having a clue what effect it may have on the people who live along the river. And that just concerns me greatly. Everything should have an economic study. If this does not have an economic study, I think it's pure malpractice to do anything with the river, with the dam, without knowing that and stuff. That's all I have. Thank you. Start working again. 
Um, it's easy to say, oh, we'll plant it, the rows are be, you know, grown and everything fine. But um, it could happen. And, it, and we see it, it happens a lot. And like I said, MMSD, they're only supposed to do it a couple times a year, and they dump a lot because of the storm, so nobody backs up. Waukesha is gonna go through some issues up there. It's not gonna be, you know, perfect. And we're gonna feel the brunt down here, and as that dam goes out, there's gonna be a lot of sediment coming down. So, that's my concern. Jim's neighbor, I have about 100 by 200 feet that's going to be full of logs and cinder. I have these same concerns. But I'm also concerned directly, about directly west of us is the Blue Barrel Sanctuary. And I'm wondering what they have done to preserve that part. And also, we have an eagle in the neighborhood. And I'm wondering what they have done regarding that. And the endangered set up to praise nesting. They're endangered, so mm -hmm. they have special status. And that's right, right out here, just probably directly west of this. Thank you, Kathy. So I think I saw you next. Yeah, um, we have nine acres um, between three and four miles on the river, and it's it's floodplain, and that's what it's there for. It's not there to be. It's, it's uh, you know, wildflowers and bluebirds and elk breeds and, and, a, and a black island girl. Um, the flooding has been getting worse and worse and worse for the last 10 years. So, and it, was, it used to be the flood for a day or two. Um, now it floods for a month or so in the springtime. Um, and, and again, that's what it's there for. But it's getting worse in this state. I don't know if taking the dam out is the answer or not, but it's, it's, it's getting worse um, year after year. So, it's a problem with Highway 31. <clears throat> I heard the comment about back here about an invasive species. Would you like to make that on the record? Or, I mean, you can obviously, I don't want to put it in the slide. Do you want to send an email or? Sure. Uh, no, you can't. Hi, Gay Javarian, Fusarian. We are lakefront property owners. Born in Racine, I live in Racine now, and I couldn't help but make a comment when we mentioned about the Blue Heron Sanctuary. Um, I used to work for the DNR, so of course I know my property. I look at everything with a different eye, possibly, than other people. And we have, and we just noticed this in the last uh, two years, we have mating sandhill cranes from the endangered species group up in northern Wisconsin. So, um, you know, it's like, what's going to happen to them? I look at where they nest, and where they are nesting is in the center of the river where the silt is, and that's exactly where it's going to be destroyed if you take the dam out. So, you know, I know that you probably looked at the area. In fact, some well-meaning government employees, either DNR, because I used to be um, in, a, in a zodiac out in our river, basically in front of our area as they got stuck in the silt and couldn't free themselves for a long time, um, were there looking, but I don't think they looked long enough to see what was actually going on. And so it takes more study. You need to see what's actually going on. I am there for a brief amount of time. You really don't see, and you don't see the seasons. I don't think the people have been out there for being like an entire year of seasons to know and document what's actually going on. So when I do hear things about it, it won't have an impact on the uh, fish and wildlife, there are other things going on that you don't see. Thank you. Okay, I think I saw hands. Peter, any out any? Maybe one more back here. Hi, my name is Susan Bailey. Um, we live on Old Mill right across the river. So if you take the dam out, aside from all the logs and everything that will be surfaced, there's going to be a lot of garbage. If you're going to just plant, what about all of the garbage that's going to be, you know, left all along the river? You know, that's all the homeowners are going to have to deal with that, you know. Concrete. 
there's concrete, there's, there's shopping carts, there's curbing, there's rebar, and it goes all up and down the river. So that'll be more of a hazard for people walking in your new planting area because they're going to hit something that's, you know, partially surfaced. Anybody else want to make a formal comment on the record in front of everybody? No pressure again. You can have a question. Yeah, hang on maybe one second. If there's nothing else, we can move into sort of a more informal question and answer period. So uh, our team's here. We have the room at least for 12 more minutes. I don't know if we can stay later, but uh, yeah. 